everyone. Welcome to Strong Female Lead. My name is Trisha. And I'm Tessa. Hollywood has been telling us what is and isn't a strong female lead for as long as we can remember, but did they get it right? So here yeah. on Strong Female Lead, we look at the portrayal of female characters in movies and television to create a social dialogue about representation of women in media. Tessa. Mm -hmm. Tessa. So <laughs> my pick for this week was one of my favorite books, Sharp Objects, the miniseries based on one of my favorite books, Sharp Objects, written by, again, Gillian Flynn. Gillian, if you're out there, represent, we're bringing you in. You take a look at femininity in the most interesting kind of way. Um, and so Sharp Objects is a mini series. 2018 came out in 2018. Um, and it basically follows the lead character Camille Preaker, played by Amy Adams. And she is an emotionally troubled reporter who returns to her hometown to cover the murders of two young girls. That is pretty much the plot. Um, in terms of just, you know, the outline of the plot and then what happens when she returns and the demons that she is facing and the secrets she's uncovering in her hometown and about herself and then, you know, learning about what happened to the two young girls. The whole thing is like devastatingly amazing. Um, what, what were your... What's your initial reaction? Because I mean, when we did Invitation, you had mentioned you were just watching the grief of oh. these people <laughs> play out. And I was like, oh shit. Because Sharp Objects is what, eight episodes? And it is dark and it is slow and insidious and painful. So what were your initial reactions to watching this? I mean, this one, uh, Sharp Objects was not as like, or at least for me, it didn't hit so uh, deep uh, as I guess I was expecting, um, oh, you know, just okay. from this author and from this genre, kind of like a true crime, you know, you're really like sitting in it, living with these people. And I'm like, I think I just felt really disconnected from these characters. And so I think that that's why it didn't really hit as, as hard, like in my heart that like these things are happening um I think that this is just okay. so well so well acted Patricia Clarkson just uh oh. I was like forget Amy Adams where is Patricia Clarkson's awards for this portrayal of uh Adora and I was like even the name I liked I was like she I won a golden this. globe she won a oh, golden she did. globe for it yeah good because that was fantastic she was like scene was stealing terrifying. every single time scene yeah terrifying. wow so impressed um and then, yeah, I mean, I don't know why. I just found it very hard to connect to these characters. Um, and I do think that, like, for me, for this one, it was actually the filmmaking. It's not the story. It's the way it was shot. Although it was beautiful to look at, mm -hmm. I didn't understand all of the flashbacks of Camille's memory as if she didn't remember those things. And I was like, no, you're just withholding things. I don't... <laughs> at no point did they say mm -hmm. Camille suffered a psychotic break that left her memoryless. And so why do we keep getting like these little fragments of her memory as opposed to like, uh, and I was like, just tell us what happened to Camille so we can move on. Because Camille is not the victim of any of these uh, current crimes that we're trying to solve. But that's the um, story. That's sharp objects also. She doesn't remember. So you're learning it in the same way that you are well, in the book. Wait, so we're not supposed to know. Well, obviously we don't know who's murdered the two little girls, but in the book, Camille doesn't remember her own past? Yeah, it, in the book, from what I remember, like she discovers the Munchausen situation. Oh, I mean like later. the rape. I mean the rape oh, and the situation oh, oh, of oh. finding the like shed, um, how her right. sister died. I understand the funeral, like um, remembering right. it from specifically your perspective, but like the rape and the allusions to rape and assault. Um, okay. I was like, why are we not just saying what it is? Like, why do we keep alluding to that something happened? And this is HBO, just show that something happened. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I don't know if it's, um, 
Yeah, I don't know if it's memory loss. I think it's flashbacks. Yeah, so I, think, yeah just, I think it's the filmmaking. I think it's, it's the just way flashbacks. the shot goes. Yeah, nothing to do with the story. I just found that, like, I was just, like, every time I felt like I was getting into, oh, Camille, you're so, like, you know, mm. such this is coloring you in such an interesting way, and then you get this flashback, which makes her unreliable, because it's, like, either she does or she doesn't know what's happening, <laughs> or mm-hmm. from her own memory. And I'm, like, it's one thing to not know, because then... Um, it makes sense why some of these connections are taking you longer to make if you don't remember something, um, or if well, you're she is. she's unreliable. Rapidly. She's yeah. unreliable in term, and she's supposed to be. So they're flashbacks, but what does she remember? What doesn't she remember? Um, and then also, um, some of them are hallucinations as well. Like she has hallucinations of um, certain words that are being that we're seeing on certain objects, like, um, and they can be pretty subtle and they just pop up out of nowhere, uh, like on her car in dirt. I think it was on her car in dirt. It says scared. And then it turns to sacred. And there's all this weird shit like that. So we're, we're basically seeing it through Camille's perspective and she has a broken mind. And it, I think it's because she's, suppressing everything and then she doused it with alcohol and I mean this is definitely like a very very true to form portrayal of alcoholism I think and that I appreciated you don't usually see it like that like that is more so how I know it to be based on you know people I know that have been through that it is vodka out of water bottles it's drinking in the car, it's doing that. There's nothing glamorous about it. Um, But besides the point, I think, yeah, she's an unreliable narrator. We don't want to trust her, Um, but she's the only one we've got. So we don't know if what we're seeing is real or not real and she doesn't either. And it's, they're telling the story. They do break it up. I see what you mean. Like you don't get enough time to actually empathize with any of the characters, right? But you do get to see inside of their 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 heads, and or at least Camille's, and what's going on. But um, there is a distance with it, I think. Yeah, which I think is very different from, um, yeah, Amy. I think is her name Amy in the other. Mm-hmm. Um, Gillian Flynn, what is the other one? Uh, the other movie? Amazing Amy, Gone Girl. Gone Girl. I feel like we, and I think it's, again, just the filmmaking, we immediately empathize with Amy, not just with the hmm. presentation of Amy, but the, like, the specter that is an Amy. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe for me it was just the filmmaking of it. Um, not to say that it's not well done. It is extremely mm-hmm. well done. But yeah. the choices that the director has made kind of left me unempathetic towards mm-hmm. the specter that is Camille. Um, I definitely, I see her as a hurt person, as a person suffering from alcoholism and mental illness, who comes from uh, quite a colorful family tree. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so all of her decisions make sense in the end, but yeah, it was kind I of a it. slow burn with not, not a lot of like... <laughs> I get it, I get it. I mean, I have to say, I loved it. Like this is by far my favorite my favorite book of Gillian Flynn's and then also my favorite out of the um, adaptations of any of the movies um, like Dark Dark Places and Gone Girl and then uh, Sharp Objects. Those are three um, that three books that have been adapted um, that I've, I've seen the movie or the television show and I just this is by far my favorite. Gone Girl, I love the story. I didn't love the movie nearly as much as I love the book, but this, this, to me, it was incredible, but I love that director. It's the same director um, who did the first season of Big Little Lies. So you see some of those similarities in terms of music, informing the characters, the whole soundtrack is basically music that the characters are listening to. And so we're there with them. Um, The music is incredible. 
just like there's so many Easter eggs. I mean, like this was the second time I watched it and I could probably watch it a third time and pick up on even more stuff. Like I was shocked at how much they put in it, but it's so subtle that you can't, you don't know what you're seeing even in those flashbacks, right? You don't know that you're seeing a word on a card necessarily. You have to pause it to see what you think you're seeing. So I, that is a bit confusing in the first watch, but I think it's supposed to just create an overall feeling. I think that's the attempt. Even if you don't know what you're seeing, you know you're seeing something troubling that is giving her more information as she goes. <laughs> if we dig into the characters a little more, um, uh, for the listeners, so Camille has a very sordid history um, back in Wind Gap, uh, which is where she's from. And this is like, this has been um, described as like a Southern Gothic drama. I'm like, okay. But it's a small town in Wind Gap. Uh, what state is it in? I don't know. Is it Missouri like- Missouri or Alabama? Arkansas? Uh, Missouri, Missouri. She left um, for many reasons, uh, but a lot of had a lot of which had to do with her family. So she she was born out of wedlock um, and doesn't know or keep in touch with her father. Um, but her mother is still in Wind Gap, and she has two Camila's two half sisters. One passed away when she was younger, and then she has another half sister. Um, who's alive and living there that she hadn't seen since she was a baby. So we start to realize that she just has had pretty much zero contact with her mother. Um, for what duration of time, we don't know, but I'm guessing because Emma is probably supposed to be like, was she like 13 or something? I think um, she's like 15, 16. She's definitely okay. in high school. She's in high school. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 she's in high school. Um, she's like 16 going on like 25. Um, yeah. And so she, it's been definitely over a decade since she's been back. Um, and you just start to pick up on the relationship dynamics when she goes back home and they're, you know, emotionally like unnerving. The mom doesn't like her. I mean, it is very clear that like she is treated and looked at differently than her half sister. Um, and then also the dad, which is, who is her stepdad, Camille's stepdad is just like, like, what, like, what is he doing? He's basically just living there. Um, it doesn't appear that him and the mom, Patricia Clarkson, are in any sort of actual, like, relationship. Um, so it's Adora Krellen, and the husband is Alan Krellen. And so he basically just drinks and listens to music. So music is an important part for him as well. Like, we're kind of, we're mostly hearing his music and Camille's music um, throughout. But... The dynamic is weird. The mom doesn't like her um, and is upset that she's back meddling, as she thinks, into the murder of these two girls. Yet yeah, it's her job. She's a reporter. Her mom just, you know, is just extremely critical and like cold to her. And no one is saying anything about it. And you can tell that Camille, for all that she like she is wary of her mother i don't know why she's staying there like what's driving her to stay there if they don't get along but you can also tell that like her mother still like means something to her and that's an interesting thing about like mother daughter relationships is you can still hate daughters can still hate the mother but like there's that human need for some sort of acceptance because you can tell that the thing she says upset, upset Camille. So anyways, yeah, she just, Camille sort of ingratiates herself into the town again, is getting all the information. The cop, you know, the chief cop hates her. The other cop, uh, the detective is sort of working with her. He's from Kansas City. I love Chris Messina. 
Um, he comes in and they're just all trying to figure out what's going on and who murdered the kids. And in the meantime, it just becomes apparent it's very close to home. Um, you know, throughout the investigation process, Camille starts having these flashbacks and and eventually comes to realize that her mother, two things, her mother has Munchausen's by proxy and killed her sister who died um, years ago. And then she finds out her, her half sister was actually responsible for the death of the two girls along with um, the half sister's friends. And it, it's like, just the layers of complications within these relationships and the way they're all working each other and the similarities yet disparities between Camille and Adora are so fascinating to me because like they're both working the men to get information um yet Adora is upset that Camille is prying but Adora is prying and just the use of sexuality by all of them and the like this is just the the themes of toxic femininity are very 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 apparent in this so i don't know i mean that's sort of a dive in a little bit of a dive into camille um but i think camille Emma, and adora are all fascinating characters but it's a slow burn man it's and it's like emotional violence and physical violence. I mean, it's just wild. So I guess what would you, let's start with, um, I know you said you couldn't really connect that much to Camille, like empathize. What What did you think about her, um, her cutting? Like, what did you think about the way she did it and, and what it meant for the plot of the story or the impact it had? Um. I mean, I feel like it was pretty obviously like these are her cuts, but they're the labels that other people have assigned to her mm -hmm. um, that she's taken in and kind of uh, projects back out to the world in her own uh, flawed and tragic way, um, which is the form of her cutting and then not letting people see herself, um, you know, when she's like intimate with the detective or that other guy. Um, well, I guess she does let that guy see him because uh, she lets him view her because he's just as broken as she is. And so, mm -hmm. you know, wear your scars on the outside and some of us get to wear them on the inside. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel I feel badly for Camille and, and what she's had to go through in terms of living with her mother in this tiny town, especially um, when it seems like the biggest conflict between uh, Camille and her mother Adora is actually jealousy and not so much uh, a disapproval or disdain for Camille. Mm -hmm. um, it's jealousy that Camille um, is a perfect, uh, perfect being when Patricia Clarkson has her out of wedlock and becomes ruined. And so she is the fault. She is the product of, uh, you know, whatever relationship. That's another thing. I was like, why are you hiding? Uh, I mean, whatever you'll un it's a mystery so you'll unveil the story as as you see fit but it was just so cagey about who Camille's father was it's obviously yeah. not they mentioned that it's not Alan but who is he and you're like left to think like maybe it's the detective and then that's just a throwaway line it's like it's it means nothing and I'm like okay well <laughs> I think uh, the chief is Emma's dad oh why that um I, I just do. I don't remember if it comes out. I mean, I read the book so long ago, but I think that Adora and the chief of police have a relationship. And I think that that's, I think he may or may not have had an idea about what was going on in the home. I think he didn't, he sort of let things go or turn the other eye or turned away from it intentionally because of his feelings for Adora and probably not wanting it to get out that he had a daughter. That was my feeling because there's no way he doesn't think that it's super fucked up in there. Like he's not an idiot. He's going in there. It's clear that their relationship is like 
transactional for her, but that she has him under some sort of weird spell. I just think it like him telling her things about the investigation. I don't know. It was weird. Uh, I think that that would be particularly fucked up if you thought if he if he genuinely thought that Adora murdered her previous daughter and then mm-hmm. left his own daughter. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a, like a step too far for any. <gasps> Um, or at least like you know you're the chief of police like you could just you know take a strand of hair and just check that shit out real quick uh no one has to know but i don't think he knows anything for sure but i think he chooses not to know and i think she has some sort of weird thing over him it's just i don't know i mean it's i think it is fucked up yeah for me adora is the most interesting character i love the way that she plays um with masculinity and power um when it suits her um and I think that that's more the relationship that I was picking up for, between her and the police chief um, is this dynamic of power. Like you might have the power mm-hmm. of your badge, but I have the influence of money and one wins out over the other. And in this tiny town full of pig farmers, it's money, right. it's access. If, we, if I close this pig refinery, or I don't know what they're called, pig farm, yeah. uh, this city would end. And that is the power that she holds at a, at a whim Mm -hmm. Um, to change the lives of not just even the police chief you know if there's no industry there's no town there's no need for a sheriff everyone well and she can impact him and his position Mm -hmm. also so she yeah a hundred percent but she's just like like, like, Emma in that way and that she wants to hurt people and she wants to do it up close the sick part of of the of this family is that they don't just want to hurt people they want to do it so up close I think that Camille's the interesting one because she turns it on herself um, mm-hmm. misunderstanding, um, you know, the jealousy that is there between her and her mother, um, and probably jealousy between um, Camille and what is the sister who died's name? Marion. Marion um, for being the perfect, to being this angel, um, and the caring for, and to show like complete disregard in the um, cutting. But yeah. They're all victims, and all three of them all three of them are victims and also victimized. So like Adora, it's like generational trauma and violence. You know, we know that Adora and we pick up on, we know she had a bad relationship with her mom and we start to pick up on the fact that her mother rejected her in different ways. Um, Maybe like leaving her outside, locking her out, things like that. And then we also wonder if maybe she also potentially had Munchausen by proxy. Mm -hmm. It's not clear. Um, But then Adora shows love or a need for love in the same way, or it's love or attention, whatever it is, she gets that by quote unquote caring for her daughters. Now, whether or not she, and giving them rat poison, right? So then she, it's not clear whether she ever tried to take care of Camille that way, but if she did, Camille rejected it, which is why Camille is still alive and Mm -hmm. which is why there's no connection with them because that's how the connection is formed with Adora by her daughters, which then, so Adora victimizes and then Camille victimizes herself right so she um passes along you know the violence but it goes inward and all over her body with what exactly what you said like labels um that she's been given and that she's rejecting she's rejecting those trappings of femininity that are like given to her and she's rejecting them by putting them on her body um therefore like making her body a less feminine or pleasing in that way it's kind of fascinating and then Emma shit Emma's victimized she I mean she is being made sick by Adora and also craves the love from Adora and knows that's the way to get it but then she also can control Adora in that way she fucking dresses up like a doll every time she's at home which is like super creepy and then she victimizes and she is violent then towards others. It's just like, it's so fascinating in terms of how you internalize um, that type of trauma and then how you act upon it. And the doll thing, I'm just like, first of all, 
there's no way Adora doesn't know that Emma doesn't look like that when she's outside. Does Adora not go outside? This is a tiny town. Does she never run into Emma like roller skating? It's yeah. just, or does she just know and it doesn't matter, right? As long as in the house. Yeah, she doesn't she drive and there's really no reason to leave the house. She has a servant <laughs> and Alan. So again, if I lived in a super rich mansion-y uh, house in the middle of Missouri, I pretty much got everything I need right here. I was very confused on what year it was because I didn't see any like Amazon stuff or anything like that. But right. I was like, it could be the 80s or this could just be rural. Who knows? It, it totally, <laughs> totally unclear. And then the dollhouse thing. So Emma dresses up like a doll, but then also has her own dollhouse, which is basically a replica of their home. But it's a home that she can then control and mm -hmm. move the pieces around. And it's very like, I just, I don't, first of all, Emma and the names. So Adora, that's just perfect. That is like a perfect name for her. She wants to be adored, right? And, and that kind of thing. And then Emma, it can also be seen as mama, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so who knows what's going on there? And Camille, like, they had this terribly problematic Calhoun Day um, that they celebrated in the South, which was yeah. horrifying, right? Calhoun Day was the best episode by far. <laughs> it 100% saved the series in my eyes. I was like, thank God, something is happening. We're getting all of the stories at once. And I was like, interesting, it, interesting, interesting. Especially the Calhoun Day great. parade or the play, not parade, the play. Yeah. And I was like, this is the generational curse that we're exploring throughout this yep. whole thing. This makes so much more sense that like a child, you know, brought to the world through rape of a Confederate soldier and a union woman and that was a daughter has birthed this generation of like horrible women. <laughs> right. Horrible. I mean, um, it was problematic on a, obviously like it's, it's tough to see, and it was a fantastic episode, you know? I mean, but that, those are the type of celebrations that happen in certain areas in the South, and they probably still do, which is, you know, like crazy, but true. So it's happening, and this is, the children are being raised in that. It's clear that Camille, like, doesn't, you know, you can tell, like, she's, she's not, fighting it in the sense she's not trying to like tell people that it's wrong she just knows right but like I think she's kind of given she's given up like it, it's just nothing she wants to go into but her name is Camille the name of the woman in the play who was raped and just said I'm gonna stay here and my husband and blah 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 and basically is gang raped her name was Camille and it's like I don't ugh. It was, that was a fantastic episode and so, so gross, like, but so good. And that is the generational thing. The, none of these people are seeing like anything really wrong with this. And really in, interesting. Yeah. And I, I mean, I actually think that's probably why I could not get into the show as much as I wanted to or thought I would, because I was really enveloped by Gone Girl. So I was, while this was going to be a very heavy, um, watching again find it like extremely hard to watch affluent people not help themselves Camille specifically she got out she there's got a lot out. of privilege like, there's a lot of privilege in this story. yeah I mean and, and I was yeah. yeah I was also confused why her editor having some inkling of her emotional past would send her on an assignment like this back to a family that I'm sure he was aware of that she had a difficult time with and so yes this is your job but b this is your mental health so I was like Again, I I'm think like, he wanted her to work through it, but like I don't but think he's throwing place. her. And then yeah, to I know. Laud him as some like savior in the end because he did the right thing, and I was like, you have been pushing her steadily towards a cliff for weeks. <laughs> and then you and then you pulled her away. You know, you you pushed her there, and then you saved her. Yeah, and I was like, he didn't in the book. He didn't show up like that. It, that was an interesting little change. Like <laughs> I just don't. <sighs> yeah, I mean. In terms of like the themes of femininity and violence and victimization and family dysfunction, I thought this was so interesting. This is a hard watch. Like this is just a hard watch. But Patricia Clarkson, 
<laughs> but, um, I just wanted yeah. to be her. Like part of me like loves that that like that uh waspy character with a heart of gold. She had a rotten heart, but like a Karen Walker or um what is the um the mother in Schitt's Creek? Mm. I can't think of her name, but that type yeah. of character who's just like a little bit of a lush, definitely on their own vibe. Um like arrested she development. She has a heart too. of gold and, and not so much here. She's definitely the the a, a source of evil. <laughs> in the yeah. lives of children is she a victim or is she the perpetrator of violence she's both yeah um what about so okay so i'm gonna shift um so what about rejecting femininity right and using femininity but rejecting it like that's a common theme in gillian flynn's um books is mm-hmm. it, there's usually a female lead who is rejecting the trappings of femininity that are being placed on them by society. Uh, do you think that these characters were embracing or rejecting femininity or both or weaponizing it, using it? I mean, all three of the the primary players. Um, I think yes to all of those options. Uh, they do all three. They, um, strip off the trappings of femininity um when it's opportune for them to you know take on a more masculine energy in terms of controlling their surroundings uh in the case of the mother ama or adora um Mm -hmm. gil uses it when she is um pursuing the case even though every everyone in her life is telling her not to um, and maybe you should calm that down and maybe you should all she knows though that's what adora does like she learned it Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. They all do it the same way. Um, and then, uh, obviously, Ama uh, takes off the trappings of femininity to commit some heinous acts of murder. Um, I think that they all use their feminine wiles um, to get what they want. It's a form of coercion that all three of them have mastered. Um, but I think, uh, especially there's a scene where Ama, is, Ama and Camille are coming home drunk and Ama is telling her, like, how do you know if people like you? And I was like, oh, no, she's a sociopath. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, well, you've given yourself away, girl, with a question like that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I thought that that was a very interesting dialogue between the, the that they were having about how I can tell when men like me, um, you know, they just want to possess me. Uh, but I can't tell when women like me or like need me or whatever um and it's such an interesting like uh thought process that i think each one of them kind of interprets in their own way women like me if they need me would be adora's women like me um if they're not threatened by me would be camille um and then women like me if i uh affirm them if i'm uh what's her name ama um so yeah i think that they all wield all aspects of femininity with lethal precision (laughs) that's interesting you say that because now i look at the relationships with women with all three of them adora with her friends camille with her friends well her quote unquote old friends from um wind gap and then emma and her friends and there's no trust with any of them and there's no um there's power plays uh with all of them and it's mm-hmm. learned and yeah. again generational yeah but i think that exists in all relationships that there's like a power dynamic there always is yeah but there's i'm those, talking specifically like, with theirs but, there's yeah. there's the ones that, that we're seeing in the story right like there's just so many similarities with all three characters how they interact with the world oh like, yeah they do it in kind of like mirror images of each other like just very bizarro versions it's just really weird because you look at adora and you're like that bitch is crazy but then you're like wow camille is doing some of the same stuff in a different way and she still has the same they're all on an island like Mm -hmm. in and of themselves um i just why the fuck wasn't Marion's death? Like that's 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 what makes me think the chief knew is because 
we see that lots of requests for an autopsy were made, that doctors knew or had an idea. Who shuts that kind of thing down? Why wasn't that further investigated? That kind of thing. That's what made me think that he he knew. And I would need to read the book again to know if he did or if maybe that's just something you wonder. But I think that he was, yeah, he was truly manipulated by Adora and like decided not to look into it because she had money and mm-hmm. because she manipulated him. But like truly fucked. Yeah. And Alan, worthless. God, I just oh, just a worthless man in the house, like doing nothing. I'm like, you are awful. Like just in not doing anything. He knew. Oh my gosh. I feel like this is uh, crazy because I felt like they gave Alan all of the typical feminine traits as I think like a test. Like, uh, because normally it would be a woman in Alan's role who's like, I didn't know my husband was a serial killer. Oh my God. He's Ted Bundy. <laughs> that Ted Bundy? Like, <laughs> and we're like, he, you didn't notice the bloody clothes. You didn't notice the knives. You didn't notice all the medication. <laughs> uh and I feel like that was Alan you didn't know he was cheating on you like come on (laughs) would be like what we would say to the woman and so I think it was like I was like oh no he's a red herring uh we're supposed to it's not like you but Alan I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and just say that you are a victimized person who doesn't know where to go to for help oh my god oh my god (laughs) fuck you Tessa that makes sense and I'm mad (laughs) and I'm officially (laughs) angry no comfort in killing I see you. Because I failed. I failed some sort of like SFL Turing test. Turing <laughs> test that like I just fell into it. You are totally right because we do tell, yeah, we're just like, how the fuck don't you know to the woman? Why didn't you do anything? But but uh, he is also he is also a victim of abuse and it's for mm-hmm. certain emotional abuse. And he's been with her for how long? Um, and he just doesn't she just runs the house he just is in his own way powerless mm-hmm. to stop it so fuck that all right yeah okay, it's fine. like the queen's husband who's not the king like right. that concept i'm like oh i forget that they can do that <laughs> just be the kings or like oprah's stedman like you're just always going to be stedman not never like mr oprah or like anything like that you're just like not that those men are abused but uh you know oh. that type of dynamic like she is the queen and you are spouse (laughs) okay so just a few like easter egg things and things that i love with this uh or in this show and listeners if you noticed any of these i mean i had to do a little research there's like subreddits about sharp objects which words pop up i mean people have done the research it's incredible but so that first like everything means something and with this director That's how he does it. Everything means something from the beginning to the end, post credits, intro song. So the first, the intro song is a 1950s melody, Um, but then they have different versions of the song in the rest of the episodes. Like one is a piano, a solo piano, another is an electronic version, another one's a hip hop version that they, for episode four, Ripe, that they add lyrics to. And the lyrics, this is when my mind was blown. The lyrics were some of the words that are carved onto, that um, Camille carves onto her skin. And I was like, kitty cupcake curls. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I'm dying. Those words are on her. They're also in the show mind broken thank you (laughs) like it just things like that I just love those little connections I would have never gotten that if I wouldn't have looked into it or watched it the second Mm -hmm. time but like didn't read her body I was like she obviously doesn't want us to read it so I was like unless they made it blatantly clear I was like for some reason like averting my eyes to reading her she said not to so I was like no Ah." they would they would make some in certain episodes they would have um a word that would become like brighter that mm-hmm. you could catch. Um, but for the most part, you couldn't really tell always what they were, um, unless again, you like paused like a mad woman. So my question is, did you see the post credits? 
in the last episode? Because I know there's like five minutes, right, after it ends. Did you watch like to the very, very end of the last episode? No, I think I stopped after it was revealed that Amma was the killer, but I'm like, <laughs> but I didn't watch after that. I didn't know there was more. So when it was revealed, you mean when she said like, don't tell mama? Yeah. So in the post credits, they show her kill the girls. Like they do that flash sequence the same way they've been doing before, but they show her and the two roller skating friends are there, strangle the girl in the woods. They show the girl in um, the bedroom. And then they also show um, the, new, the new friend she made. You can see her like hands on a fence and it looks like she was strangled also. So like, we never see any, we never get any insight into what Emma is actually doing until the very end because we're all through we're seeing it through Camille's perspective and then they just wrap it up real fast and it's like five seconds and it's like oh shit and and then my question is how the fuck did she make those teeth into an ivory floor like what sort of carpentry is she doing in the dollhouse you know when Camille saw hmm. the teeth mm -hmm. the whole floor in that room of the dollhouse was made of the teeth of the other people she killed. And I'm like, okay, those are some carpentry skills. And then also interesting is that everyone thought it was a man. No one thought this was a teenage girl. And they kept saying, you know, a man would do it. A woman couldn't do that. She had to pull the teeth out with a plier, just like all sorts of, there were just these little it, tidbits everywhere that were just like, mind-blowing but what does okay so you didn't see that you probably won't go back and watch it now that's fine what does Camille do with that information <laughs> what do you uh, think Camille does right now when she finds that out knowing that her sister's been victimized but also knowing that her sister probably just killed again I mean fuck your victimization if you just murdered three people fuck you <laughs> obviously right. she into the authorities that's not even a consideration you're too far gone <laughs> there's a sure. too far gone no if she would turn her mom in why wouldn't she turn her sister in for actually doing the crime that makes no sense she's irredeemable <laughs> she should Mama, she no should God. but like camille who knows what camille will do that's the thing I like you would have more sympathy for a mother who at least uh i don't know i feel like she'd still have more of a connection with her own mother than a sister that she's only hung out with for a week for sure for sure yeah, weird. And then you just be scared. And then the fact that she cares that her mom knows, that's the interesting thing also. She still has this power over her, even though she knows mm -hmm. she was trying to kill her. Like, I don't understand. Everyone, like, no one's safe. And how about Patricia Clarkson? When she, she was so good at those, like, fucked up mother statements. Because you know how moms can say something where it starts to sound like it's going to be something nice, and then it's not. And all moms have this ability to do that. Patricia Clarkson, like, honed in on the skill. There was one scene where she's saying something, and it sounds like she's really connecting with Camille. And then she's like, that's why I could never love you. I was like, oh, shit. I'm like, my God. Like, toxic mom just I mean it was just so fucked yeah that was just like wow I mean you might have felt that uh or even suspected it but to have your own mother say something like that to you must be just absolutely shattering uh absolutely shattering but I mean again the scene was so well done Camille's face is just everything when she's just like do not react you can see like her mental dialogue is like, do not react to this. Um, even though it's like also like crushing her again, Amy Adams, I don't think I've said that you've done a wonderful job, but like you're already have an SFL. So I mean, whatever. Yeah. We all know that you're a great actress. You're, you're incredible. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, yeah, just Camille's face in that moment. I was like, I think that that would also be my reaction if my mom ever said something like that to me. I'd be like, hmm. I'm not going to react to this because I won't give you the satisfaction of having my reaction because I feel like when you say something like that to someone, you're really just fishing for emotion uh, for sure. and I will not give it to you. Uh, but you can always tell though, 
Amy Adams' eyes. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why she's so good. They're just almost the whole time. You don't know if it's because she's drinking as much as she is, but they seem like she's has like tears in her eyes a little bit like throughout the whole show and mm -hmm. I'm just like oh god and I saw it in her eyes when her mom said that also but it's like she was I mean she fought back right emotionally and you could tell that she it was a constant struggle but she was drawn in also like Emma no boundaries like Emma yeah, if you mom, say no someone She's in the inner circle from, from day one. Like what boundaries as a, especially as a, as your mind is forming, as your emotions are forming, what it is, your ideas on what love is are all formed around the relationship you have with this person. Mm -hmm. uh, and to no, have I'm that not faulting her for it, but Camille okay. was unable to fight it, which was fascinating to me. Like Emma was just like draping her, like with whatever she was feeling, saying, wanting her to do. And Camille would act like she would fight it and she'd always give in. And I was just like, I hate everybody. You guys are doing so, it's so bad. I did really like the, um, the like busybody woman who was always, um, always drinking. She was like my, like outside of the family, she was my favorite character. I felt like that character was so, felt so real I feel like every town has that woman or a family of that woman who's just like mm -hmm. you know hair would be so tall because it's full of secrets and it's everyone else's secret <laughs> <laughs> you know like I just feel like she's that woman she and then see, I loved when she broke down when she finally reveals the information about um the younger daughter who died um and how she she did what she could but she's under a, a you know a, a certain amount of pressure in in a certain you know atmosphere of I also have to live in this town and I have to you know survive in this town and I don't know if her husband had died at that point but she's like I'm alone in this and so to blow up uh this powerful woman's spot by revealing this information um, or being more direct than I have been that would be putting me in danger and this woman is capable of murder so. <laughs> and the police don't believe me the hospitals don't believe me I did what I could it just that breakdown I was like again another another gem of a performance uh, for right sure there. she was the woman in weeds um cynthia or whatever in what? um in weeds oh weeds yeah 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 okay um yeah she yeah she had a hair filled with secrets yeah <laughs> hi to heaven it was yeah yeah just a she's a terrible little town and then also oh god and when Adora says you spell ripe. I'm like, she just says like, the, and I'm sure that Camille reeks of alcohol. I mean, it's coming from her pores, but like it just the thing she says, I'm just like, good God. I've never seen like a community of people drink as much as these people. <laughs> um, and I was like, is this accurate? It is what? uh is this accurate I, I'm very curious <laughs> I know because um, Camille's like she was clearly an alcoholic but like no one was calling her out on it which means she was her drinking was just fitting into everyone else's lives like when she's with the investigator I mean I get why he or the detective I get why he's drinking with her because he's working her but she just has this like flask of they just like whiskey while they're looking for the dead body broad daylight I'm like Jesus brown liquor broad daylight like <laughs> good grief <laughs> yeah and the pregnant lady the pregnant lady when they're on the drive just has oh. a setup and I was like I am so concerned is this why you can't have an open bottle is that why this rule is a thing uh <laughs> in have you never had a shower pop or not a shower pop a car like a roadie yeah, but like, I always wondered why, like, <laughs> this is codified into law. Like, a beer in a car is like, didn't cause your accident. It's the 15 you had before you got in. Like, uh, <laughs> but she has like full on, she's like, this is a good whiskey or bourbon or something. And I was like, do yeah. people do this? <laughs> yeah. Is this real? Is this uh, fantastic for screen or is this real? And I, I think it's, it's not real. <laughs> I think it's probably real. I mean, I've seen it to a smaller extent, not like a bottle mm -hmm. of whiskey, but like a drink ready for me open. Yeah. 
as I get in the car, driver with one also. I mean, I'll just admit it. And I'm from Cleveland and I'm not proud of it, but it's happened. Um, so I think it, there's a great possibility. Yeah. I took it to mean that like everyone in this town is suppressing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also I was like, please don't be real. <laughs> please don't and there's have nothing to do. <laughs> there's nothing to do. That's the issue also in towns like this. Like, I mean, there's nothing to do. That's what they do. They drink, they gossip, they hate their friends. And they drink. But uh, we've talked a lot about the show. Yeah. yeah. But are we, uh, we going to talk a little bit about the uh, criteria by which mm-hmm. we rate our films? Um, the first of which is, um, is the lead character top build? And I think there are quite a few lead characters. And thank you, award season, for doing a lot of the hard work for us by <laughs> appropriately awarding these women the, the laurels that they deserve. Um, so I think that I think all three of the Krellen women, or I guess Camille's last name is Freaker. Mm-hmm. So Ama, Adora, and Camille, do you think, I mean, obviously they're top bills. Do you think that they have agency? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think all of them are SFLs. I mean, they're all being controlled by something, uh, for sure. But they do have the agency. I mean, because otherwise we would say that if someone was you know, victimized, they lose all their agency, right? So even though they are victims, um, yeah, they're, they have agency for sure. I think so. What do you think? Oh, I 100% agree. Um, as both victims and victimizers, um, or abusers, whatever, I, I don't know which one is correct, but, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, 100%. They have their agency. And then do they move the plot along? I mean, the revolving uh, story <laughs> between the three of them is the entirety of the plot. So I 100% yeah. nail that one too. <laughs> yeah. And they probably, I'm sure it passes the Bechdel test because a lot of the talk is about um, the girls that were murdered. And the men are really just tools for them in this. So without looking it up, Mm-hmm. I can say with 99% accuracy that they passed the Bechdel test, which means that it two female characters talking to each other about something other than a man. And do they have names? And conversations definitely happened between those three characters about something mm-hmm. else, usually their own relationships. 100%. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the masculinity? I know it was a subdued masculinity, but any thoughts on the portrayal of masculinity or, or femininity? femininity (laughs) I mean yeah we talked a lot about it but I think that they're both the female characters are both rejecting and using femininity um and masculinity you know it just uh I think the females are exhibiting what could be considered masculine characteristics the males are, are not really, I mean, maybe the detective, not the chief, but the detective, but he's, he's just a plot device. I mean, he's nothing more. Um, the rest of them. Yeah. I I don't know what the message about masculinity is other than if masculinity equals power, then the women are using it in that way to, um, reject the femininity and the the cages that have been put on them I guess what would you say yeah I agree I think that um the masculinity in this and also in um what is the other one uh gone girl no memory gone girl (laughs) um Mm -hmm. is very interesting in that it I think that uh Gillian Flynn does a really good job of showing kind of a symbiotic nature of masculinity and femininity and that they can both be abusers and the abused Mm -hmm. um nobody has the uh you know the rights to being a victim and being a perpetrator of violence um it works both ways and i think that like it's nice to see female you know villain type characters and and see how what does rage look like from the female perspective as opposed to a male perspective. Um, 
that would mostly apply to Ben Affleck's character in Gone Girl as opposed to the men in this because we're not seeing them display um, anything near what I would call rage, um, but mm-hmm. mostly Ben Affleck. And then as opposed to female rage, which in the case of Amy was like so extremely polished. Um, so like porcelain like in the exterior but so rageful vengeful and willing to do anything um, to maintain her current status and to exert her will and or power over her life and her situation and have that juxtaposed against the Preaker Camille Preaker and the and her mother Adora and the sister Ama um, in their wild representation of female rage um, and how that like circulates through the bloodline and how that manifests so differently and so ragefully and violently in each of them, but also in a very Southern way. Um, I know, genteel. As, yeah, yeah, it's not as genteel as, as Amy, but it's very, um, it's just as potent, it's just as effective. Um, and that brashness, um, because they are Southern, almost comes across, across as charm, mm-hmm. but... Uh, I have a lot of family from the South. And so I, I, I know, I know a bless your heart when I hear one. Uh, <laughs> oh, fuck you. So, uh, and so I was like, they came across as slightly less charming when it hit my ears. And I was like, Oh, why are you, why are you coming for everyone? Always like, no. <laughs> I was like, what are you going to like, <laughs> what could possibly be next in terms of uh, <laughs> subtly and unsubtly shading uh, your friend, your quote unquote friends and uh, the people of your community. Um, but yeah, I liked seeing masculinity in this way and that it is also something that is fragile, but not, um, I don't know, like precious. Uh, it's both fragile and precious. And when it is like stomped out and stomped over and uh, abused and victimized in the ways that it is in sharp objects, I think it's nice to see um, mm-hmm. because we don't think of masculinity masculinity in those ways typically and it's so easy to just jump to the you're being a bitch man up uh you know you you know you have a job to do wipe your tears away uh you don't get to feel you don't get to be abused because you are part of a a a body of people who in society have the upper hand but it doesn't mean that you're you can't be a victim so yeah and actually it that made me think you know about the boy that everyone that was arrested for the murder, because mm-hmm. one of his sisters was murdered. That character was fascinating. You know, everyone just keeps mm-hmm. bringing up that he's crying. They're just all, you know, like, oh, he's just crying. I think he's guilty. <laughs> like, because he, I was like, Jesus, this mm-hmm. kid can't win. <clears throat> you know, like, yeah. my God. Um, and he was just broken. Yeah. From he, what happened. Yeah just had an emotion and was brave enough to express it. Um, and then the, uh, especially from the women, as his girlfriend was like yeah. somewhat, uh, she was oh, she was more like a, like a man up girl who would just be like, oh, my man is like, you know, I can just like picture her hitting him in the chest and saying man up, like, you know, like get it together while we're in public type thing. Dry your tears, we're doing an interview, I'm throwing on my cheerleader uniform. Like, yeah. well, what was up with that? <laughs> I just God. Oh, I geez. know. Yeah, but it's so all dark. All, oh, go ahead. Oh no, it's just no. Go ahead. Oh, just so dark with the um, with Emma, like fucking with him too after having murdered his sister, and the friends mm-hmm. having helped, and then just them just hanging out at the house. And her, like, you know, hitting on him, in a sense, like, seducing him, and then tearing him apart, like, within the same conversation. It was just, Mm -hmm. like, good God, like, yeah, just painful. Yeah, and I'm just curious, like, um, I, well, maybe you know, but, like, what was Amma's motive for doing this? Did they ever say in the book? I think um, it was... I don't remember what they said, but I think it was her reaction to um, the violence upon her. So it was her her reaction to it, probably in a sense to just like gain some control or whatever. Like so, these girls kind of were 
truly innocent. They did nothing to her. There was no reason why she chose these girls. Just they were out of town, not from oh, there. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Her motive, um, her motive was they were getting attention from her mom. So they were tutoring. She was, they were being tutored at her home. They'd come over and mm -hmm. her mom started investing attention in them. Same way, uh, same reason she killed the, uh, the new friend that she made when her and Camille moved because that friend got attention from Camille when she said that she wanted to be a journalist. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, so very childlike in a sense. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, because the only way she got love or she knew any sort of connectedness was with her mom and Camille in whatever way that that was. And so she um, she got rid of the competition. That's terrifying. Uh, guys, <laughs> everyone just go and tell every female family member that you have that you love them. Uh, yes. Just, you know, go ahead and smooth that right on over. If you've been holding out an I'm sorry or an I love you, just go ahead and yes. make that make that call yeah. send that text yeah <laughs> just go and smooth do it, it smooth it over man. something extremely petty <laughs> wow <laughs> oh, oh my god uh so i would rate this five out of five what about you <laughs> um i think it's just like three and a half or four out of five i do really like the series um I do really like it. I mean, God. Guys, thank um, you, everybody, for listening. Please reach out to us on social, on Instagram, at Strong Female Pod. Yes, and tweet at us. Tweet at us some of your other favorite book to movies. Uh, we'd love to do them. We want to hear about it. And we're SFL underscore Chicago on the Twitter. So please tweet at us. <laughs> And rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you pod. Dun, dun, right. dun. Until yeah. next week. <laughs> More female rage. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.